Welcome to the Writer's Edge Podcast, a platform to share conversations about the health and wellness of horse and rider. I'm your host, Farley Schweigert. Hey, y'all. This is Farley with the Writer's Edge Podcast, and today I'm having a conversation with Larry Gardner from Spalding Fly Predators. Welcome, Larry. Thank you for coming on the podcast today. It's nice to be here, Farley. Thanks. So typically with um, Writer's Edge Podcasts, um, we, uh, I let everybody kind of tell their story and introduce themselves. So, um, so give us um, the, the story of Larry and, and how you got involved with Spalding Fly Predators and kind of introduce us to all of that, please. Well, like most of your uh, people on your podcast, I'm bitten with the same horse bug as everybody else. I've loved them since I was a kid, and I've been riding since I was a, a very young man, even in junior high school, and owned my own horses. Like everyone else, I got a couple of horses in my backyard. I enjoy riding my horses. I feel trial bird dogs, horseback. So we ride Tennessee walking horses. We send pointing dogs afield, and we follow them. And we do it uh, on a scheduled trial basis. We go in one-hour heats, and we'll typically go six hours a day with a break for lunch ride a couple of different horses and they, they that's what that's what I fell in love with I have as I said I've got horses in the backyard and back in 1996 I said to my wife after seeing an ad in Western Horseman I'm going to buy some of these little bugs to try to get rid of flies and she said well you'll just buy anything and I said well I don't like flies and she said I don't either so I bought some fly, some fly predators and I came to my house I put them out I did what they said about three months later, my wife said, I don't know what you're doing for flies, but keep doing it. So since 1996, I've been using this product. I retired, and in about 2005, uh, I started going to horse shows for Tom Spaulding to talk to people about fly pressures just to have something to do. Now it's turned into a full-time job again 17 years later. So I get to spend my time talking to people about bugs, which is really cool. And so that's my story. Fabulous. I've... um. A lot of my listeners have been, um, they have wrote in and said, hey, what about these fly predators? Do they work? What do you know about them? Um, and so that's why I was like, ah, we'll, we'll reach out and see if we can have a conversation. So, um, so kind of start walking us through what we need to know about flies and, and how to take care of them. Yeah, the one thing that I can tell you that's absolute in horses is that every spring, flies are going to show up. If you have domesticated horses at your property, you're going to have fly control problems starting in the spring. And typically, everyone doesn't attack the problem the same way. There's a lot of tools in the toolbox to help you with fly control. So there's a couple of really basic things we need to know. First of all, there's two kinds of flies, and you need to identify those. There's the fly that bites you and the fly that bugs you. And when I say you, I mean you and your horses are both. So the, the flies that just bug you are what we call common house flies. They're field flies. They come from manure. They hang around. They get in your picnic. They mess with you. They get on your horse's face. They get around your horse's eyes and nose. They get in your house and you got to swat them. Those are just common flies that bug you. That's the most common one. Typically, you're breeding those on your property because you have manure. And manure is where they breed. The second kind of fly you got is the fly that bites you. And there are several types of those. The most common one is the biting stable fly. And the biting stable fly is a fly that looks just like a house fly, but he bites your horses down on his legs and it bites you on your ankles if you're wearing shorts and it's springtime or summertime. There's also a big fly that people call the B-52 or the green bomber, and it's known as a horse fly. And that fly bites your horse, and he, he exacts a terrible bite. And then there's the little chicken wing fly called the deer fly that comes out of the woods, and he'll bite you if you're riding on trails or going out. Then there's also a horn fly, which is a cattle-specific fly that bites horses up on their withers. So we have to deal with those flies two different ways. The flies that bug you are easy to get. The flies that bite you are a little harder. So we need to have two different sets of tools for two different sets of flies. The fly science basically is real simple. 
the stages of a fly's life is a fly lays an egg. The egg becomes a, pu a larva, which is also known as a maggot. And the maggot pupates into a cocoon. And then out comes an adult breeding fly ready to go. Their life cycle is about 30 days. And the female fly can lay about a thousand eggs in 30 days. That cycle can reproduce every eight days in the middle of the summer. So every eight days, you have a brand new set of flies that are going to make another thousand flies out of that set of flies. That's how rapidly they can reproduce. So what we do is we want to get rid of the fly before he gets to the last stage if we want to be Re, instead of being reactive, if we want to be proactive, we try to kill the fly before he gets to the adult. If they get to the adult, then we have to kill them another way. We have to be reactive. So the, the first tool in the toolbox for fly control is good manure management. If you pile your manure in a pile or spread it on your fields after you've piled it in a spreader, if you pick it up, if you're clean, you're going to have less flies because they have less opportunities to breed. So that's the very first thing you can do to have really good fly control. The second thing you want to do if you want to be proactive is you can use several methods. You can use fly predators, which are the natural enemy of the flies. You can use insect growth regulators, which is a feed through additive that you feed that will kill the flies when they're in the maggot stage. The fly predator attacks the fly when they're in the pupa stage, the cocoon. So that's the proactive way, good manure management, putting out fly predators, using insect growth regulators. That's the best way to be proactive instead of react. Now, flies also come from your neighbors. If you've got somebody next door to you with a bunch of cattle, or a bunch of horses, flies are opportunists. They're going to go where they got the easiest pickings. They're also lazy. They don't like to fly very much more than a quarter mile. But if you're upwind from somebody that's got a cattle ranch, you're going to get their flies. So you will have to be reactive with your integrated fly control if you're going to use that method. Have I thoroughly confused you so far? No, I think you've done great. Like you, you are, yeah, you're systematically laying it out for us because you got to have a foundation of what's going on to be able to um, figure out what you need to do to change um, to to help your horses. Right. So to make either one of the proactive methods work. You have to have a few parameters. One, if you're going to feed an insect growth regulator, which is Solitude or Simplify, there's several brands out there. You're basically feeding a chemical to your horse that when the horse passes it in his manure is poisonous to a fly. So you're feeding your horse a chemical that's going to kill something. I don't like to do that, but that's, you know, some people do. It's a preferred method. It's a tool they can use. If you're going to use fly predators, you're going to have to put those out before the flies get a head start on breeding. So the only three things to make fly predators work is to get started in the spring before the flies get started. Our website will tell you, based on your zip code, when you ought to start. The second thing you need to do is get enough of these fly predators so that you can combat flies based on the number of animals you have. So if you've got five horses, you're going to need a small amount. If you have 10 horses, you're going to need twice that. So we, we deliver them in increments of 5,000 and 1,000 per big animal. The third thing you're going to have to do to make that method work is make sure you release the fly predators where the flies are breeding rather than where you're seeing the flies. Where flies congregate and where they're breeding are two different places. They're congregating in the barn because it's cool in the summer, warm in the winter, the horses are there, urine smell they like, manure smell they like, so they're hanging there. But they're actually reproducing out of the paddock, the pasture, the manure pile, out where there is manure. So if you're going to be proactive, you've got to, with the insect growth regulator, simplifier, those, you have to feed it to every animal that makes manure on the property. So if you have three horses and four roping steers, and you're not feeding IGR to the roping steers, you're not fixing it. And if you are in a if you're in a boarding stable and you just have one horse of that's twenty other horses in the barn and you're feeding an insect growth regulator, you're not solving the problem because you're just managing one animal. So you have to be you gotta use common sense and you've got to feed that to every every place. 
Using fly predators, you have to do, as I said earlier, start at the right time, get the right amount, put them in the right places. So those are the proactive things. Manure management, you can pick manure. And if you're a real good manure picker and you got the best manure fork in the world, you're still going to leave crumbs. And that's all a fly needs to reproduce. Something that most people don't think about it either is people come to visit you. And if they bring horses in a trailer so that y'all can ride or run barrels or team rope or do whatever you do together, they bring flies with you. Or if you show when you go away from your property to go to a horse show, you get a horse trailer full of flies that you bring back home. So that's when we get to the reactive stage. So when we get to the reactive stage, what we're trying to do is kill adults. We're trying to kill the flies we see. Same thing is true when you're being reactive as proactive. You don't necessarily want to kill flies only where you see them. You want to also kill flies where they're reproducing. So if you're, if you're piling your manure in a big manure pile, that's a wonderful practice. It's a good practice for getting rid of flies. And here's why. The, the pile of manure is starting a decomposing heat that is too hot for a fly to reproduce, except the outer one inch or so. So inside it's cooking. And if you ever pile manure in the winter, you'll see steam coming off of it. That means it's creating a decomposing heat. Once that manure decomposes, a fly's not interested in it. So you're doing a good thing by starting a pile if you have a manure pile that you spread. If you put manure in a spreader and spread it on your fields, if you're taking that spreader out of the barn area every eight days, you're doing a good thing. If it stays there more than eight days, you've made an incubation place. And a lot of people will fill a spreader and they've got two horses and it takes three weeks to get the spreader full. Well, from the eighth day on until you empty that spreader, you're incubating flies in that spreader. So you, you've got to use some common sense methods, knowing that flies reproduce every eight days, a whole new cycle. We need to get that manure dried up, spread out, piled up, out of the area. Now, if you don't ever clean the area where the horses are, that manure, as long as it's moist, is going to make a fly. So we work proactive. We wake up. It's July. We're in, covered with flies. So what do we do? So what we have to do is we have to get those flies out of our ecosystem. And there's several ways to do that. You can do those with baits, tapes, traps. You're going to trap the fly to get rid of them. Most people think the only solution is a fly spray system or fly spray in a bottle. That's not a bad tool. It's part of the tool. It's a tool that well, what that does is it repels flies. It doesn't necessarily kill. So the, the fly doesn't like the way that smells. He'd have to get a lot of that stuff on him to kill him, but it will kill some flies. The ones that don't, it doesn't kill that you spray, if they create a resistance to that fly spray, it makes your fly spray less effective all the time. So it's a tool, and it's the tool that's most commonly used as the only tool, but it really is not the best tool in getting rid of flies. Traps are much better than spray. Because if you trap a fly, he's gone. And there are several types of those traps. There's ones you add water to them. They're called pheromone traps. They stink and they attract the fly. And the biggest problem we see with those is people put them in their barn. So they're attracting flies to the barn. So we tell people put those away from the barn. They work best in shade in the summertime. You can hang them from a tree. They'll collect a lot of flies in that bag. You dispose of it. There's several different types of those. as the, the disposable flat ones you can buy in the feed store. There's one called Trap and Toss. It's a plastic dome that it'll sit around. You can use it. But it's the same principle. It uses pheromone. It uses smell to attract a fly. There's another kind of trap that you can use. It's a sticky trap. It only uses glue and color to attract a fly. So the fly sees a yellow trap. He thinks, oh, that's a melon or a peach or something I can eat. And he goes over there and gets stuck on it. So that's the one that will stick him. You got you use glue. There's no pesticide. There's no smell. You can use that one in your tack room. You can use it in your in your horse trailer. You can use it anywhere. There's also uh, only one method that will get the fly that bites you, and that's the biting stable fly. And it is a glue type trap called a bite free stable fly trap. You put it in the sunlight, and it has a mirage effect to the fly's eye. They see a heat register. They go over there, they get bit, uh, stuck on it when they're trying to bite something. So the bite-free stable fly trap gets the biting trap, the biting stable fly, and all the other traps get the manure flies. 
that the flies that just bug you. Baits are something used judiciously that a lot of people use. You can use them. They, they basically, the flies eat the bait. They die where they are. You have to be careful with those because they are poison. But, you know, there is a place for those who use judici judiciously. Those will work fine. Uh, fly slaughters work good. <laughs> if you got a fly, you kill one fly. It could be that the fly you killed is an old gal just hanging around that laid all of her eggs already. So you may not be accomplishing a whole lot. But every fly you get out of the ecosystem is one less fly, you know, to bother. So we're going to be proactive or we're going to be reactive. But if we are reactive, we need to have all the tools. And the tools include baits, tapes, and traps. And the right kind of traps in the right kind of place will do that. And if you have a lot of people, as I say, coming and going, you're probably going to have to fight all. Never hurts to have a couple of traps out all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's, um, let's talk about the fly predator a little bit more because it is another, you're introducing um, another insect in to be a predator to those flies, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, the fly predator is a naturally occurring bug. Okay. They're here. They're indigenous North American. They're little bitty. They're about the size of a flea. When you release them, you'll probably never see them again because they burrow. The fly predator female has to lay her eggs in the cocoon of the fly. She doesn't make her own cocoon. She's what's known in, in entomology as a parasitoid. She's a predator and she's a parasite. So she finds the fly pupa, the stage after the maggot, by smell. She attacks it. She lays her eggs in there. She takes a little juice out of that to live on. And she lives her 30-day life cycle about that mimics the fly's life cycle, laying her eggs. And each, each egg that she lays and each fly pupa that she parasitizes is one less fly that's going to be born. So we're not introducing anything new. We're just introducing the enemy of the fly, which is naturally on your property. They're, they're on everybody's property in, in all 49 states. We don't ship to Hawaii, but in all the other 49 states, they're indigenous in their Canada and Mexico, they're indigenous. So, but there's not enough there to control the flies like we want to have control. In their normal natural state, they want to control from five to 10% of the flies because they want to keep a food source in front of them. So we overpopulate the good bug that gets rid of the bug we don't want. Now, the reason we have flies is we created our own fly problem. We like our animals close to us, so we domesticated them. We got them on small property. We're making our fly problem. If, if animals roamed naturally, you wouldn't have the type of flies that you do when we domesticate flies, animals, and keep them close to us. So the fly predator naturally occurring, they're they're a member of the wasp family, but they don't have a stinger. So their only purpose is, and that's the only purpose they have. If, Farley, if I released them in your kitchen, they would die hungry in 30 days because they wouldn't have anything to reproduce. They would not have any way to eat. So in the, in the natural where you're putting them loose, they're reproducing about 10% as fast as a fly can. So that's why each month we send you a batch, you put them out, and every month from spring to fall, you release the fly predators and then they'll knock down the flies. And it takes a new batch every time because we can't outbreed a fly. Flies outbreed us about 10 to 1. But again, you'll never see these once you release them because they do burrow and they're tiny. They're the size of fleas. You'll, when we send them to our customers, you can see through the bag and you can kind of see them. It, it appears I've sent you a bag of dirty brown rice with some wood shavings in it. And in two or three days, you'll see some little bitty bugs crawling around in it. That's the fly predators. They're ready to go to work. The females do all the work. They lay all the eggs. They, they parasitize all the fly people. The males are just there to breed the females. Then that's the end of their life cycle. They're dead after. So there's no downside to fly predators. They don't get on people. They don't have a stinger. They don't get on animals. Horses aren't going to eat them. Dogs aren't going to eat them. You, again, you'll never see them once they're gone because they're burrowing in the manure. And when I say manure, there is also another place that produces flies, and I, I just failed to mention it, and that's rotting organic material. So if you feed round bales in the winter and there's any residue left of that round bale in the spring, that is a fly factory. 
and that produces the biting stable fly that bites you. So you want to be sure and clean those areas up. Any, any place you fed hay on the ground, you want to make sure those get burned or disked or turned under or cleaned come springtime. If you've got any areas in your pasture that stay wet all the time, those will produce worms because it's decomposing organic material. Uh, it leaves, compost, any of those areas will also make the fly that bites you and that's a biting stable fly. I didn't tell you about the deer fly and the, ho and the horse fly. The horse fly breeds in water. Mm -hmm. It's very much a cousin to a mosquito. And the same thing with the deer fly. They are a waterborne fly. Now there is a trap on the market, a couple, that get those flies and they work quite well. One of them's called an H trap and one of them uh, is called the horse pout. We resell the H trap because we found it to be the best one. Uh, it's an excellent fly and it, what it does is it uses a big black ball, tricks the fly into thinking something to bite, gets caught up in a collector and they can't get out. So it is a trap. But the horse fly and the deer fly. Now there's some other flies specific. If you have readers in the Northeast or, or, or viewers from the Northeast, there's a black fly up there that they refer to as a buffalo gnat or a black fly or a may fly. And what they are is a waterborne fly as well. And they bite and they're nasty. I've heard some people up north call them teeth with wings because they're mm -hmm. nasty. Mm -hmm. and, and even you live in Arkansas. I, some of those buffalo gnats have actually made it down to Arkansas oh, because of the moisture. We have all of them. We have horse flies and we have every kind of horse fly you can, you can imagine. And some of them you can't kill with a bazooka. Um, we have buffalo gnats in the spring, and of course we have mosquitoes, uh, particularly where I'm at in, in northeast Arkansas is um, very much rice country. Um, yeah. And so we do have a lot of moisture. So um, we have D all of the above. Everything we've talked about, and, and particularly um, in this part of the country, the horse flies and the mosquitoes and the buffalo gnats um, are, are definitely... I would say our top three nuisance. We we came out last year with a primarily all essential oil fly spray, which is not chemicals. And it is an excellent repellent. The flies don't like the way it smells. Neither do mosquitoes. And it works great on buffalo gnats. It works great on, on mosquitoes. It works great on horse flies. It works great on biting stable flies and regular flies. We actually had our entomology staff tested this scientifically, where they counted the number of flies on several uh, uh, several horse incidents where they went out. We published that information on our website, comparing our product to other products. It really is a very effective natural fly spray. You can use it on yourself. Uh, it's great for mosquito control on yourself. Again, it's primarily essential oils, so it's got a nice smell to it. Uh, it they only thing that's a downside to our fly spray is right now it will stain a gray horse because it has a derivative of vanilla in it and it kind of makes a stain. So we, we encourage people if they're going to show paints or pintos or gray horses, be careful with our fly spray, but any other horse, it won't stain them at all. So fly sprays, we didn't talk much about those, but fly sprays repel flies more than they kill, I said earlier. So if you're going to use fly spray, it's not going to hurt fly printers as long as you don't spray the fly spray directly where you put the fly pressures out. But, you know, if you're going to spray your horse and go riding, that's a good good way to use fly spray. If you're going to fly spray just before you compete, you know, that's another way. You can use uh, chemical fly spray or you can use the non-chemical. I prefer the non-chemical. We're very proud of our fly spray because it is a non-chemical. But uh, uh, the people that put fly spray in their barn, they're not eliminating flies, they're repelling flies. So when I say that that's the most, it, it's the most commonly used tool, but it's the most commonly misused tool. So all of those tools go together. I've given you a lot of information. I know you I, I surely didn't cover everything. No, but gosh, it, so much good information um, because it's, it's, um, it is springtime finally. Um, and um, as it's kind of, the days are going on, um, I know particularly here, buffalo gnats, and I saw my first horse fly yesterday. Um, and it's, um, so we are rapidly going towards fly season, um, particularly here here in the south. <laughs> yeah, it, and it, it's, it, 
that's kind of the way the fly season starts, Farley. It starts in the south and goes to north. In the northeast part of the country, there's still a little cold. When we when we offer fly printers to our customers, they go on our website, put their zip code in, and we recommend a start date and stop date. And typically, the temperature is when flies start producing. When the nighttime temperatures consistently get above 40, and the daytime temperatures consistently get above 70, that's where fly breeding starts. And it stops on the other end when frost starts. When you start getting early frost, that's when the fly breeding stops. But what happens is every year there are flies that overwinter in decomposing materials somewhere down deep in the corner somewhere, and that's how it all starts. The, the interesting thing about it is the reproduction. I got a chart here. I want to tell you this chart. It's really amazing how the potential of flies are. If you start with two flies on April the 1st in those optimum temperatures of 40 to 70, 21 days later, that can be a thousand. 42 days later, that can be half a million flies. 63 days later, it can be 250 million flies. And if you go 105 days later and you haven't got anything, you, you, you're up there, 125 million, six billion flies. They, their reproduction opportunity is unbelievable. However, that'll never happen because they, everything likes to eat, you know, flies, birds eat them. There's a lot of natural predation that goes on with flies. But if you'll help them with their natural enemies or your other enemies or good cleanup, the reproduction will never happen. A um, couple of common misconceptions I always tell everybody. Uh, they think they see baby flies. There's no such thing as a baby fly. A fly is born as an adult. There is a, a, there is a fly called a lesser house fly. He's just a smaller variety. And typically what we get on horses are regular house flies. A lot of people get horses, they'll get flies on their horse's faces and they think those are face flies. No, those are flies that got on the horse's face. Face flies are mostly a cattle fly. But horses like, I mean, flies like the, the fly eyes, the horse's eyes, the horse's knows because that's moisture and that's what they're after. Uh, they'll see flies biting their horses on the wither if they're in the proximity to cattle. That's horn flies. They're after blood. They're tiny. They are about half size regular flies. So they'll say, I've got these baby flies biting my horse on his wither. And qu first question we ask is, where are your cattle? Well, they're right here because it's, they will transfer over from cow. Interesting thing about a horn fly, they can only reproduce in undisturbed cow manure. So if you have roping steers or cutting cattle that are in a short pen and moving around and roughing up their manure, you won't have horn flies unless they came with when you bought the cattle. But if you got pastured cattle, you will have horn flies. So uh, there, those flies will transfer over to your horses if you do have some of those. Uh, really not a lot of other myths. Uh, oh yeah, one of the best myths is it's been a, it's been a real warm winter so we're not we're going to have a terrible fly year the most terrible fly year you have is when it starts warming and never cools if it just starts a spring and just gets nice and warm you never have those warm days cold days warm days cold days that's what makes the best fly control as far as the environment is concerned but when it starts a nice warm moment it doesn't take many flies to make a fly so the the severity of the winter or the, the lightness of the winter has very little to do. Rain is what has the most to do with fly reproduction. If you have a wet year, you're going to have more flies because everything becomes viable once it's wet. Uh, any deeper than that, we get into entomology that people probably don't need to know about. <laughs> so you really, know? yeah, so really you're saying it's not the winter, it's more about the spring. If, if you have an up and down spring like here, we were really warm last week and um, we've been down in the 30s and 40s and barely up in the 60s, you know, this week. Um, so it's, we've had that dip uh, in spring. Um, it's been, it's been plenty wet, period. It, it never stops raining around here anymore, but um, so it's really more about the spring versus the winter. Yeah, uh, wet, wet weather makes a lot of flies. And if you have a lot of start stops, that's really give you early control and the less breeding opportunities you have. You know, if you, if you want to use the fly printers and you put those out early, we have a lot of customers that never get flies. Uh, you know, I got three horses in my backyard 
I barbecued out last night. I didn't see a fly. I rarely see flies because now occasionally I do, you know, because I live in an area where there are other horses. If the wind blows, they'll blow in some flies. I always keep a trap or two out, you know, and I, my goal is to never see a fly, but you're always going to see a few, but not. Many. So, uh, the thing about Spalding and, and, and this is kind of a commercial. We've been around for 44 years. We, uh, Mrs. Spalding started this business as a tabletop business back in 1976. Her youngest son, uh, Tom now owns the business. Everybody that works for us is a horse people. You know, we all use fly predators. We have an entomologist on staff that keeps us scientifically educated as to what we're doing. We can help people with their fly control problems. Not only do we help people with fly control problems with horses, but we also do a lot of zoos and a lot of dairies and a lot of food production and other people that want to use a method other than chemicals to kill flies. So we, we have fly printers in a lot of places and we've been doing it for a very long time. So it's really kind of an interesting business to raise a bug to get rid of a bug, but we're raising a good bug with no downside. Sure. So there's my commercial flypredators.com or spalding-labs.com. There's a lot of information on our website that's free. We have a 32 page fly control guide that identifies every fly, where they breed, what they breed, how they do. It gives you every information on every type of fly, including horse flies, deer flies, and all of the other ones that we talked about. That's on our website under fly control. There's all kinds of information. We try to be educational. We have some videos and some other neat stuff, but there's a whole lot of education on the website. Absolutely. I've been on your website and, and there's so much information there. And that's, that's what I love about um, getting to, to chat with companies, you know, that are putting science out there and trying to put information out there to educate people um, in, in addition to having a, a good product. Um, because if, if you don't have the knowledge um, and the foundational knowledge, um, to go where you want to go, that that's the first step um, to get there so that you can get where you want to go. Yep. Well, we have, we have, as I say, customers in 49 of the 50 states, and we've had some customers that started using fly printers the first year we were available that have never stopped. You know, like I say, I've been using them since 1990. I don't know what I, how I would control flies without them because it's easy. It's not very expensive. And typically, the cost to use fly predators for five horses is about 23 bucks a month. And the average customer is going to use about six or seven months. So we build them, we ship them, and build them every month. So it's like you get a new bag and you pay 23 bucks and deliver it to your house and you put them out and you're done with it. So typically, it's not an expensive way to get rid of flies, but it's a really good way if you want to use fly predators. And our customers, about 90% of our customers return every year because it's just the easy way to get rid of flies. Now, you know, there's always some reason that they might not work. And typically if you live next door to a dairy, these aren't going to work for you, you know, because it's hard to do that. But other than that, primarily this is a pretty good way to get rid of flies. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, I think you've given us a, a lot of great information today and given us the foundation of um, fly control, what to do, and and how um, fly predators work in that, and and all the aspects of that because it, it's a mul it is a multifaceted uh, system, um, and we have a lot of tools in the toolbox to um, to help with that. Yeah, well, I hope everybody has a fly free summer. If you if you if we can help, just give us a call. The people that work for us, as I say, all use fly predators. They know what they're talking about. You can tell them your situation. They can make a recommendation. If you want to use those, if you want to just use anything else, we can recommend what we think are the best products. We have tested everything in this category and we do refer products of other companies that we know that they make good products. And so we don't mind recommending other people's uh, products to use. And we've done that. We recommend traps. Uh, we recommend this, uh, the biting stable fly traps. We recommend the regular traps, the pheromone traps. Also, the one for horse flies, we recommend those. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff on our website that are tools. So you can go there and see, or if you want to talk to somebody, you can talk to one of our women. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time today, Larry. I really appreciate it. It's great. Um, and I enjoyed, uh, I hope I didn't bore you too much with bugging you about these flies. <laughs> no, not at all. Like, I think that was um, the best way to, to learn about bugs because that's often not a, 
not an exciting um, topic to talk no. about. <laughs> it's, kind of, it, it's kind of nice when you don't see them. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank Thanks, you for Barbara. coming on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Writer's Edge Podcast. For show notes and other thoughts, head over to writersedgetherapy.com. If you would like to stay connected and continue the conversation, head over to my free Facebook group, Writer's Edge Health and Wellness for Horse and Rider. Thanks for continuing the conversation, and as always, I will see you down the road.